Hi, good afternoon. Today we're going to complete the activity that we started on Tuesday that focuses on a set of passages from the Master of the World, 1904 by Jules Verne. We're trying to identify key passages where the language and the style of the passage communicates themes of fear and seduction in reference to new advanced technologies. After the completion of the activity, including perhaps sharing of the results of your findings, I will say a few things about a text that is not part of the required readings, the black motor car from 1905, simply because it shares the same moralistic view of an advanced technology, advanced for that time, such as the automobile. Then I will introduce today's film by going back to the three films we've seen so far, including this one, comparing the themes and the patterns in the stories, the development of the characters in The Love Bug, Bumblebee, and Christine. And we'll see the beginning, the first, at least the first 30 minutes of that horror film from 1983, which is a bit of a cult classic in the genre still a film from 1983 so in some ways a dark fairy tale more than a horror film but at least when the remake comes out possibly next year you'll be able to say that you know about the story these were the instructions to focus on this set of chapters called The Terror that you find under week 5, particularly chapters 13, 14, and 15. Find passages that are relevant for our examination, analysis, and discussion of themes of fear and seduction. You can copy and paste those passages and then add some comments. Don't worry about formatting this as a text with a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's for the writing, written assignment of next week. For the purpose of this exercise, is sufficient even if you have a series of bullet points and loose comments, that would be fine. And I would like to hear some of the best passages, the most, uh, um, the, the strongest and most interesting passages that you found. I recommend it that you use your Google Docs file where you can also include the names of whoever worked with you. So if you have initiated that work on Tuesday, you can go back to that file. As usual, I'll be here and available to help you. If you need, instead, pages, I have the usual forms. Just ask for one. So, I don't know where you are, how much you uh, did on Tuesday. But I'll give you at least another 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. But let me know if that's too much. We can... Uh, uh, switch to the discussion sooner, okay? If you weren't here on Tuesday and you need help, call me and I can provide more information about the activity. If you were working on, with, on this with another student who is sitting in a different location, feel free to move around, okay? Let me move on then. And keep in mind that the assignment based on this text is due Friday of next week, October 4th. 
I want to talk briefly about another book that is not a science fiction book. It's a dark tale. Uh, it's a crime, crime story in a way. It's called The Black Motor Car. It was published by a British writer in 1905. Might have come out uh, in, in bookstores before the end of 1904. As you see from this illustration, at the very center of the novel, you find a prodigious car. This time, it's not like the terror. It is just a car. It can only go on the road, but it's endowed with incredible speed. It is even actually more impressive than the illustration itself because the description you find in the novel of the car tells you that it's 18 feet long. And the description of the chase that takes place at the end of the novel when the good guy, a British aristocrat, is trying to stop the evil guy, William Jardison, tells you that this particular vehicle has to be maneuvered almost like a ship, meaning that you have to think in advance about your next movement, about a turn. You have to slow down before you apply the brake and then take the turn, negotiate the turns carefully because of the size of the vehicle. Yet this vehicle is so quick, 150 miles, 200 miles per hour, that the criminal, together with his accomplices, can do crimes uh, is basically a thief all over England and bring fear exactly because it seems impossible to stop him. What's, what's interesting about the novel is the moralistic view of the technology. The central idea that whenever you have a very advanced technology that could be made available to any number of people, then you have a shift in the balance of power within society. And that's it, that is even more dangerous when this technology is not controlled by the government and anyone, even at the fringes of society, where you can find deviant members of the community, criminals and such, can either produce, create, or purchase something like this. At the beginning of a story, you find an average middle-class guy who works in a bank, uh, is married, uh, but he falls into temptation because of a seductive, evil woman, Marie, who convinces him to steal a great sum of money from the bank where he works, the plan would be for them to leave England, go to South America, and start a new life as a happy couple there. Of course, the woman is not really in love with this man. She starts trying to get the money out of the bank and then disappear with that money. By the time Jack understands that the crime that he has committed, motivated by passion or lust, is useless, will not produce any real change in his life, it is too late. And to top it all, his wife learns of the affair and she dies of a heartbreak. She literally dies of a broken heart. At that point, Jack is a broken man, abandoned by his lover, having committed a crime that's the first and only crime he has ever committed, always being uh, an outstanding uh, member of society. He ends up in prison, and many years later, when he is released from prison, Everybody has forgotten about him. He takes up a new name, William, William Jordison, works on a car, 
because he had a passion for engineering, even though he was a bank manager. But it's it's a typical moralistic twist for the hero and the anti-hero, the idea that you have a guy who was honest, moral, could have had it all. On top of that, he had some uh, special skills when it came to engineering, but it applied it to the wrong kind of enterprise and activity. So he works on this car and comes back into society under the guise of this thief, not just to make money, but more than anything, a la Count of Monte Cristo, to have the means for his revenge. And the target of his revenge is, of course, Marie and other people involved in the events that led to his incarceration. So he uh, has a uh, number of criminal associates. He has a secret hiding uh, lair. And from that, thanks to the speed of the car, he can go everywhere in England to steal or to kidnap people who were involved, according to him, in his demise and need to be punished. As I said, there will be the good guy, the hero, who um, is a sportsman, somebody who likes the automobile and automobile racing, and thanks to his own skill and good morals, he will be able eventually to chase the criminal to his hideout, free the people who were kidnapped, and at the end of the novel, as you are expected to find, the evil inventor dies, the technology is destroyed. The moral of the story is be careful. Progress in the field of technology may appear to be a great thing, but there are moral dangers because of the shift in the balance of power. When these technologies are involved, even the government, even the police, has a much harder time controlling crime. And this, was, this idea was part of the culture of that period. It wasn't just the fiction that conveyed that message. Even criminologists, for example, Cesare Lombroso, an Italian criminologist, whose works were translated into English and used in the US and England during that time, wrote a famous article on the bicycle where even just the agility and the speed of the bicycle used in an urban setting looked dangerous to him because he purported that criminals could commit a crime, a theft, a robbery, a murder, and then jump on their bikes, move to another location in the city, be seen in another location almost at the same time as the robbery, and therefore have an easier way to get an alibi. So if this is what they thought about the bicycle in reference to potential growth of criminal activities, can you imagine uh, what might, they might have thought about the car? You find here a few uh, uh, notes and a few passages. Of course, the language, as we found in Jules Verne, is very emphatic. The speed is qualified as terrific. The motor car as enormous. And as usual, the car is almost silent because this way it cannot be easily found. It can disappear. And a lot of these crimes by the evil protagonist are done at night for that very reason. The car is made of steel. And you can see in this description what I was saying before, how the car is not really described the same way we think of the automobile. It looks more like a ship or an engine 
the engine of a train. Look at this passage. It was in truth an ugly thing. Ugly because it's menacing. A cross between a hearse. Hearse is a reference to the death that, that is caused by the vehicle or because the vehicle is an instrument of evil in the hands of this criminal. A cross between a hearse and a locomotive. Locomotive because it's not as agile, very fast, but not as nimble as cars, even around that period, uh, where, of course, it's an advanced kind of technology. It is the product of a prodigious mind. Yet the important thing about all of these madman inventors of advanced technologies is that they don't come out of the industry. They don't come out of the schools of engineering. They come out from the fringes of society, implying that the technology is dangerous exactly because it represents a subtraction or a movement, a transfer of power from the central infrastructure, the schools, the government, the army, to society itself. And therefore, it's something that becomes harder to control. Look at this passage in reference to the speed of the car annihilating space, because it can be everywhere at the same time almost. It might one day be in Yorkshire, and the next day in Devon, and the next in Inverness, right? Talking about different parts of the United Kingdom. It might be seen anywhere and by any inhabitant in Great Britain. So one vehicle in the wrong hands is sufficient to bring havoc uh, through the entirety of England. Of course, because it's an instrument of evil, it's black, right? Painted black, bonnet, body, wheels, all a dead, dull black without any luster of enamel to relieve the gloom of its surface. So you can see how even the description of the car is imbued with this moralism. And you can find a few more ideas in the presentation under week five. Now, let me introduce the scenes from Christine. Keep in mind that you can find Christine on Amazon Prime and you can also check on this uh, website that I find in general very useful, justwatch.com will tell you where any film can be found streaming. The prices are not always up to date for rentals. They're updated only once in a while, but it's a good way to see if you might be able to stream it from a platform for which you already have a subscription. Okay. So Christine from 1983 is the story of a young American student who lives in 1978, goes to school, at school is constantly bullied by other students, and you'll see how menacing those students appear, that they look like criminals. And luckily, Arnold, nicknamed Arnie Cunningham, has a very good friend, Dennis, who's also the quarterback in the school's football team, and therefore somebody who has a bit of power and a reputation within school. And so to a degree, Dennis can and will protect Arnie from the most extreme manifestations of bullying. One day going around in Dennis's car, Arnie spots a wrecked 1958 Plymouth Fury that is parked outside the broken home of an old guy, typical of horror movies. Arnie will fall in love with this car in spite of its appearance, will even offer a sum of money that is excessive for the conditions of that car. 
And even though his friend Dennis tries to dissuade him to tell him first that he shouldn't buy the car, second that he's paying too much, and third, Dennis feels that there is something about the car that is ominous. In spite of that, Arnie gets the car, takes it to a junkyard during that period and for a long time before the 1970s, you could work on your car in a garage, rent a place, leave the car you were working on in that place and then work on it during the, a period of weeks or months. So Arnie brings the car to a garage slash junkyard, works on the car, the car becomes beautiful. At the same time, while working on the car, Arnie is also working on himself and he changes, becomes more confident. He changes physically. He walks differently. At some point, he will not need his glasses any longer. Becomes more successful in school. For example, becoming the boyfriend of a new female student, Lee, that everyone, uh, every boy in the school would like to have as girlfriend. Soon enough, though, it's clear that Christine is possessed or inhabited by an evil diabolical spirit. Christine becomes jealous of Lee, uh, Arne's girlfriend, for example, and tries to kill her at a drive-in. Christine will also defend Arnie when the bullies try to destroy Arnie's car because they think that by destroying the car, they will decrease the amount of success that Arnie is having. They want Arnie to go back to being the nerd and the weak guy that he was, and, and they think the car is part of his clout of his prestige but when this group of bullies damages the car we'll see that Christine is able to restore itself based on its inner powers and then will go after the bullies and kill the bullies by the end of the story Arnie becomes just the extension of the car becomes the evil minion of an evil monster will become the servant of the car and Dennis this time in, in alliance with Lee and his former girlfriend will have to do something to stop both Annie and Christine at the end of the film the car has been destroyed however we have signs that the car, the spirit inhabiting this cube of metal has not perished and that therefore it may re return to be a car and lure another <coughs> owner and enslave the mind of that owner through the seduction uh, offered by afforded by the powers of the car. When we compare Christine to the love bag, the story of Herbie, and also to Bumblebee, we find that the encounter between the user, owner, and the technology is reminiscent of a human relationship. Because when you look at the story, Jim and Herbie have this encounter in the shop where Carol and Mr. Thorndike are working. Jim Douglas goes into the shop in San Francisco, attracted by the black and yellow sports car labeled the Thorndike Special. In real life, it was a real car named Apollo. And then when he realizes that he cannot buy that car, Herbie comes out, Herbie comes into his life, and a connection is formed when Mr. Thorndike 
is abusive verbally and physically towards Herbie the car. And Jim comes to the defense, to the rescue of Herbie, tries to defend and protect Herbie from the abuse. Then we know how Jim Douglas leaves the shop without any car, but Herbie is following him to his house. And the police the next morning will tell him, you need to come to the station. And in order to escape the accusation of theft, of car theft, he will be forced to purchase the car. So it's a relationship that develops in a complex way and a relationship that brings the technology and the user closer and closer together. In the case of Jim, Jim will not appreciate right away the value of Herbie. In fact, the first experience is kind of negative because he realizes he cannot control the car. He thinks the car is rigged. It's a kind of prank played on him. And only later he will realize how powerful the little car can be winning races. And then he realizes that the car is sentient, alive, and will have to establish an equitable relationship with the car in order to win the big race at the end, the El Dorado. In the case of Charlie with Bumblebee, Charlie is the first one to see value in Bumblebee. When she sees the yellow beetle that Bumblebee has transformed into in the junkyard. And this establishes the premise, the empathy, that the relationship with technology is built upon. Later, Bumblebee in the garage will reveal itself to be a, a droid, a sentient robot, and there will be a chance for them to reveal their respective stories of loss, of uh, both have lost track of their plans in life, of their mission. Both are trying to rebuild the future. But the relationship is based on certain element in their meeting and the deepening of their relationship. In the case of Annie and the, and the evil car, Christine, Annie is clearly taken by Christine and like Charlie... He sees something in this Plymouth Fury that no one around him sees. Dennis, his friend, only sees that he's being ripped off, that the car is not worth the money that he's paying for. In fact, might even not be worth the time it'll take to restore. The old man who sells the car to Arnie knows that the car is evil in one way or the other because it was owned by his brother and his brother and his fa and his brother's family suffered and he suspects the car is involved with the events that led to the suicide of his brother so arnie makes the first step in building the relationship with the technology of the car by showing interest, a great deal of interest in the car, and then commits time and energies to restoring the car, we know that Christine is not in need of restoration because we'll see later on that Christine is able, just based on its magical power, to bring back the shape of the car and the polish of the car. It's just a test. Arnie passes the test by working on the car and showing that he is worthy of receiving the powers of the car, and then the car will in turn enslave him because it's like a diabolical relationship, the devil and the person who's made a pact with the devil. Keep in mind that basis for the story is a book by Stephen King. The car is not only sentient, but a key part of the identity of the car is the fact that the car has its own idea of what justice means, right? In the case of Herbie, it's clear that there is a bad guy in a comedic way, Thorndike, greedy, ambitious, willing to cheat, abusive towards people around him, exploiting the people around him. And Herbie and Jim both share a different sense of what justice is. 
Bumblebee has lived through the wars that are forcing his people, the Autobots, to leave their planet and find refuge on Earth to escape destruction by the enemies, their enemies, the Decepticons. So he comes with his idea of justice as a central value. And Christine, even though Christine is an evil machine, but Christine has a simple view of what is good, who is good, what is bad, who is bad. For example, by enacting a series of acts of revenge against the bullies. 